As language teachers, we feel a love, passion, and excitement for sharing about other cultures and obviously their languages with our students. Sometimes when I'm planning a unit, I get super overwhelmed because there's just so much we can talk about. There's so much to share and there's so much that I want to share with students, but I don't want to overwhelm them. I don't want to give them too much at a time and I don't want to drown them in information. I have found that using virtual field trips gives my students a chance to explore and learn about another country or a culture in a way that isn't just me sitting and clicking through slides of my study abroad from 10 years ago. Virtual field trips might seem overwhelming and super techie, but I promise if you can copy and paste a link from one place to another, you can handle virtual field trips. Let's do it. Hey, my name is Ashley, aka Senorita Spanish, where I provide easy to use resources to save you time and energy in your classes as your lesson planning. If you're new here, I just wanna make sure you know that links to everything I mentioned will be down in the description box below. Okay, so the title, everything you need to know about virtual field trips is probably a lot, kind of overwhelming. So I wanna give you kind of a heads up as to where we're gonna go and what we're gonna talk about. First, we're gonna talk about how to fit virtual field trips into your curriculum. Maybe you have a ton of things to cover, you don't have a lot of time, and you're going, this sounds really cool, but I could never make it work. Yes, you can. We'll talk about how. Then we're gonna talk about what it looks like in an actual lesson plan. So not just where it fits in your curriculum or your unit, but what it actually looks like on a day in your classroom. And we're gonna, of course, talk about how to create them or how to set them up. I told you at the beginning of this video, it's not super techie. As long as you can copy and paste links, you can make a virtual field trip and you can share them with your students. I promise you can do it. So we'll explain exactly how in this video, okay? Let's get into it. So first off, when can you even use virtual field trips, especially if you feel like your curriculum is just packed anyways? I love to use them at the start of a new unit. So maybe you're exploring a new country, maybe you're gonna do a reader that's based somewhere else. I think they're a great way to kind of kick it off and get them to know the setting of the novel or where your unit of study is going to take place. Virtual field trips are also great for any sort of cultural celebration because you can give them a lot of information about different practices around the world or around a country so that way students know, hey, there's more than one way to celebrate this. It's not just like this. It could look like this. It could look like this. It could look like that to help them get an idea of just how varied practices are depending on where you are, right? The third option is a sub plan. Virtual field trips are an awesome sub plan and we all need at least one of those at some point in time. Things just happen. They come up in our lives. So whether it's an emergency sub plan or something that you had planned going on, a virtual field trip is a great sub plan plan in a day that's not wasting class time, right? They're doing something effective, they're learning, but they don't necessarily need you to be there and hands-on teaching. They're also a great option to have them do individual work. So maybe you're doing a speaking assessment that's one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Everybody else can be working on their virtual field trip while you're pulling over students or working in small pairs while they do that assessment. And the last option is that it's a great way to get students lots and lots of input in the language. One of my favorite virtual field trips I do with novices really focuses on origin, saying where people are from in Spanish. So the way that I have that map set up is that, as you might imagine, there's a lot of markers all over the world and students click on a map, they see a person who is from that country, and then they read a very short paragraph about that person, what their name is, where they are from, and what they're known for. I really pack it full of cognates because I use this you know, within the first month of the school year, they're doing this exploration and they get so much repetition with that phrase, S day, wherever, and they get to really practice seeing where all the Spanish speaking countries are and they get to learn a little bit about some of the people from those countries. It's a great thing to do at the beginning of the year, especially if you're looking for something for Hispanic Heritage Month. All right, now that we've talked about a few ways you could fit it into your curriculum, let's talk about the actual setup, like the tech part of it, which I promise is not scary. <laughs> The biggest thing that I want you to understand is there's a lot of different ways you could do virtual field trips. There's quite a few different programs you could do and I always recommend doing something that is simple for you. So you could do it in Google Slides, right? Maybe you're really confident with Google Slides because you've been using it. You could use PowerPoint. If you were a die hard PowerPoint user, Google Earth is a really cool tool and there's lots of tutorials on it out there. I personally prefer to use Google My Maps because I find it to be kind of in between those two. So Google Slides is something we use all the time. So the novelty is a little bit worn off, right? It's not as exciting or as 
thrilling, I think, to use Google Slides to make a virtual field trip. However, the pro is that I'm really, really fast at making Google Slides. It's something I'm very proficient in. So that is a good option, especially if you're trying to make your first one and you're like, I can make Google Slides in my sleep. Use Google Slides to make your first virtual field trip then. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Google Earth is really, really cool, but I almost think it's got too much cool, if that makes sense at all. Kids can kind of get overwhelmed in the like explore and the drag and the in and the out and the zoom and all of that sort of stuff. And it can take a while to load, depending on the student devices, depending on the Wi-Fi, depending on if your kid has their laptop charged or not and they're trying to do it on their phone. Oh my gosh, sometimes that just doesn't work. And so that's not really a process that I want to experience during class because then we're really not experiencing, you know, that joy and engagement and discovery. They're getting frustrated instead by technology and that's not what we want. So. I like Google My Maps because it's kind of an in-between. It is novel, it's interesting, they can drag and drop and do that kind of exploring feeling, but it's not so like heavy processing, computers can't keep up with it or any of that sort of stuff. It's a happy medium. After you've chosen the tool that you're going to use to make your virtual field trip, the next question is often, well, what language am I gonna make it in, right? We're language teachers, this is a language class. Should this be in Spanish or should this be in English or should this be in the target language or should this be in their L1 or the shared language of the classroom? I always say that that depends on your students and it depends on your goal. So the first thing I ask is, you know, is that language gonna be a barrier to getting the information through? Can I communicate what I need to communicate to them incomprehensible language, are they gonna be able to really get it? Or is it something where like sometimes they just need to get the information about the culture in the shared language of the classroom and then we can dig into it in the target language in other ways in other activities later on. My personal favorite thing to do is to put the information that's in the virtual field trip in language that is as comprehensible as possible and then do comprehension activities to go with it in English. This way, this document, their handouts, their activities are kind of supporting the language by what I'm asking them to do and what I'm kind of steering them to. We'll talk about that steering thing later on when we talk about the lesson plan. And I can check for their understanding. I can understand whether or not they got the information from the virtual field trip that they needed to get and it you know, did they did they comprehend it? That's very important. Sometimes with novices or especially with exploratory classes, I like to just do English and English, right? Virtual field trip in English, comprehension activities in English, and that's just fine, right? In those sorts of situations, sometimes it's just better to get the information to them rather than to be focusing on the language, especially in an exploratory class when the language acquisition isn't the goal. And then on the other hand, in upper level classes, there's no reason why we can't do Spanish Spanish if their language abilities are there. You're still doing comprehension activities, you're still checking to make sure that they understood it, but there's no reason why their language skills can't be all processing in the target language. So now we've talked about some tools you could choose to create them. We've talked about which language to do. Let's talk about how to actually create your virtual field trip. I'm gonna give you the step-by-steps -step when using Google My Maps because that's the tool that's my favorite. And the steps are pretty similar if you're using Google Slides or Google Earth, or even if you're using ThingLink, they're all kind of similar. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna choose your destination and choose your language goal or language goals because if you don't have that end in mind, it's really hard to create your activities and make sure that you're actually helping your students learn what you want them to learn. Then I like to gather the basic information I want them to understand. So if we're going to a country, what languages are spoken there? What's their government like? What's the flag look like? Basic. Then we're gonna level it up a notch and we're gonna get into some of the actual information. For virtual field trips, I really like to think about the three Ps. If you're familiar with that, the products, practices, and perspectives of anywhere that we're studying, I think that's a good way to get a couple of different pieces of information in the map without being super overwhelming and without like me getting sidetracked. Because sometimes I'm like, ooh, food, let's talk about food. And then all of a sudden there's 20, 20 things to explore that are all different kinds of food that are delicious and I'm hungry and we haven't actually talked about anything else. <laughs> so making sure that I do that kind of balance really helps me make sure that I'm introducing my students to a whole bunch of different things without overwhelming. I also like to do some comparisons. So one example that's really easy that I like to do every time I explore a country with them is to explore the land area and compare it to a United States and compare it to one of the states in the United States with the land area of that country because that kind of helps them get a feel for it, right? Sometimes maps are hard for them to judge just how big or how small a certain land area is. So I like to give them some sort of comparison to help them better grasp that. Another thing that you can do is to compare one practice to another. So when I do a Cinco de Mayo virtual field trip, I like to compare how it's celebrated 
in California, how it's celebrated in New York, how it's celebrated in Chicago versus how it's celebrated in different parts of Mexico. So they can start to make those comparisons and see, okay, this piece of culture is not the same. The next step is to gather media. And this is images, this is photos, this is videos, this is graphics, any of those kinds of things that you might use to illustrate what you are talking about with your students, you're gonna gather that all. And the reason why I recommend that you do that first is because the in tool search engines are not as refined as just going to Google or just going to YouTube. So when you go straight to YouTube, you can filter for things like how long the video is, how recently the video was uploaded. That sort of stuff can make a big difference. Whereas if you're in the tool, like if you're in Google Slides and you're going insert video, search by, you know, search on YouTube, you can search and you're gonna wind up with thousands of responses, but you're gonna have to sit and scroll and scroll and scroll. So I find it much more effective, a much better use of time to find the media first. Even just like 9,000 tabs are gonna be open because you're gonna be like, yep, 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 yep. And then start creating once you have stuff. And then put it into the virtual field trip after you've gathered those resources. Quick note, I do not include a YouTube video for every single thing on the map, but I do like to include several because I think it gives students a better sense of what they're exploring. I also think it does a better job of giving the actual perspective of somebody from the country. Okay, now we're gonna take all that information that we gathered and we're gonna put it into the actual tools. So if you're using slides, if you're using PowerPoint, if you're using Google Earth, if you're using Google My Maps, whatever you're using, all of that information you've taken, you're gonna put it in the thing that's going to deliver the information to your students and that they're going to actually explore for the virtual field trip. Four is optional, but I always recommend doing something like this it's to create some sort of handout, graphic organizer, or comprehension questions, some sort of activity where you can check and see, did they understand this? What did they get from this? That kind of thing. And some people like to do an activity after they've explored. I like to do something along the way because sometimes students just like click through and they're all done. And sometimes students like click and like, which is nice because if I put a lot of time into finding different YouTube videos, I love that students will sit and watch the different videos because they're so into figuring it all out. But sometimes a handout can kind of help them keep on track and make sure that they're not spending six class periods on one virtual field trip, right? It's a balance. So whatever you choose to do, I again, highly recommend doing something to check your students' understanding of the trip and the information that they learned while they were on it. So step five is also optional, but it's also something that I highly recommend, and that is planning a time filler or a fast finisher. What will happen, I guarantee it, it will happen. When you do a virtual field trip with your classes, one kid will finish really pretty quickly in comparison to others, and one kid at the end of the class period will still be sitting there with their headphones on, just fascinated by something. I don't know. You never know what's going to catch their eye, right? You're going to find something that's going to be just so compelling to a student. And all that means is, is that students are going to be finishing at different points in the class period. And just for classroom management purposes and for an effective use of your time, I always like to have a fast finisher ready because you just don't know. I do have a whole video where I detail different fast finishers and ideas for time fillers or sponge activities, whatever you want to call them. But I highly recommend as you're planning your virtual field trip to just pick out a few fast finisher activities to have ready for those kids who are a little bit quicker at getting things done. Okay, the next step, we're almost there. Believe it or not, there's only two more steps. The next step is to update your share settings. So whatever tool you use to, to create the virtual field trip, you're gonna go make sure that students have access to it, right? If you created a Google Slides, if you created Google My Maps, you need to click share. Anyone with a link can view and then make sure that is good to go. And then if you created digital handouts, same thing, you're gonna make sure share and it's easy for students to see, or you're gonna print and make copies of them either way. Okay, here is the last, last step. And this is why I said you can do this. If you can copy and paste links, you can do this. The very last step is to assign it to your students. And so if you use Google Classroom, you're gonna make an assignment. If you use Schoology, Canvas, whatever your LMS is, you need to post that link in a way for students to be able to see. And if your school doesn't use an LMS, then just create a bit.ly, right? Go to bit.ly and then put in your share link take that shortened text and put it on your whiteboard for students to enter into their devices. However you're gonna get them to the virtual field trip, that's your very last step to assign it to them. And then like I mentioned with the handout slash comprehension activities, whatever method you use to create those, whether it be digital or printable, you're going to give those to them, okay? But not, not at the same time. We're gonna get to that next. <laughs> so now that you've done all of this setup, you know where it could fit in your curriculum, let's talk about how the actual lesson plan looks because we just talked about how to assign it. Let's talk about what you're gonna actually do during your class period 
the day of the virtual field trip. Some people like to make this like a big event by, you know, arranging their classroom and to look like an airplane or to like, you know, it's kind of like a teach like a pirate sort of style of things where you're changing the setting of the room to make it feel even cooler. I think that changing your classroom like that is super cool. I have never done it for two reasons. One, I often travel. I'm often in multiple classrooms. And two, I'm lazy and kind of cheap. <laughs> it costs money to buy decorations and it takes extra time before or after school to rearrange your classroom for something like that. I kind of think that one of the coolest parts about doing a virtual field trip is that it is virtual. It's not this big affair. <laughs> I think it adds a lot to the environment. It can add a lot to the lesson. I just have never had the motivation to do it. So kudos to you if you're a person who does that. I'm just being honest. It's who I am. Here I am not decorating my classroom like that. Okay, so whether or not you choose to decorate your classroom for the actual lesson, this is how the class period itself rolls out in the way that I like to do virtual field trips. I always, always, always start class with a start of class routine. I have a longer video where I detail that and I'll make sure to link that for you in the description below. Then we do one of our weekly routines. Again, I have a longer video explaining weekly routines. It could be weekend chat, it could be free voluntary reading, it could be Musica Miracle Ice. Any of those sorts of routines come after our everyday start of class routine. Again, I'll link it for you below. After we've done the start of class routine and the daily routine, then it's time to begin the virtual field trip itself. And this is where the assigning comes into play. First, you're gonna give them the actual tour. You're not gonna give them the handouts or the comprehension activities first, right? If you use Google My Maps or Google Earth, something that they're just like gonna click around on, give them time to explore first. Otherwise, you're gonna have kids who are just finishing the homework and they don't get that exploration piece, they don't get that discovery piece. It's just not as fun, right? It kind of defeats the purpose, in my opinion. After they've had some time to explore, and this is a little bit different for every class, but for me, it's usually between five to 10 minutes of exploratory time. Then I give them the thing that I want them to do with the map, right? To do with the exploration, the comprehension activities, the handouts, the graphic organizer, whatever it is, I give that to them after they've had some time to explore, and then they have time to work on the actual comprehension piece that goes with the exploration adventure. After they finish their handouts, after they finish their comprehension activities, they're all gonna be finishing it at different times, so that's where that fast finisher comes into play. Let's talk about some options for fast finishers. Like I mentioned earlier, I do have an entire video where I talk about different fast finisher activities, and I will make sure to link that for you in the description of this video, but I wanted to give you some ideas that are specific to virtual field trip follow-up activities. So, you could give them a YouTube video that explores one of those pieces more in depth. It could be a Rick Steves video, it could be something about food, it could be cooking, it could be music, it could be about a musician or about a famous person. There's a lot of different YouTube videos out there. You could pick one. Maybe when you were researching for the virtual field trip, you found one that was so good that you wanted to make sure that everyone saw it. Perfect for Fast Finisher, put it there. Next option, you could have them write a summary of the places they visited. This could be in the target language, this could be in the shared language, either way. You could also have them talk about something that they learned. They could write about highlights from their trip, you know, any of those kinds of things. A cute option would be to make a digital scrapbook. So maybe you're using Jamboard or maybe you're using Google Slides and they just create one page that kind of summarizes everything that they really thought was most interesting. Kind of like a smash doodle, but digital. You could even have them do a paper smash doodle about the virtual field trip that they took, highlighting the information that they learned and the things that they took away also an option. You could also have students pick one thing that they learned from the virtual field trip that they want to learn more about and just find, you know, five to ten more facts about it, that kind of thing. The only thing about this is that I would maybe be careful, depending on your topic, right, especially if you're doing like artists or famous people or something like that, letting them loose to just kind of explore about somebody's life, depending on your setting and the level you're doing this with, could be a little dangerous, might be a little controversial, depending on the images and that sort of thing. So just keep in mind that that's maybe not an option for all levels, but could be a good option for your upper levels. Another great option could be to create a dictionary page or a Pictionary page of sorts 
with five to 10 new words that they learned while doing the virtual field trip. Of course, this works best if your virtual field trip is in the target language, but that's a good way to do it. So that way they're kind of gathering words that they learn in context while exploring the culture. Another option is play GeoGuessr. I have a blog post where I detail how to play this and what I love about it. It's perfect for a virtual field trip because it is that exploring, it is that adventure, and it's a game. So that's a great option. Everything that you need to know about virtual field trips in one video is kind of a lot. So if you have any questions as we're doing this or if you have any comments, make sure you drop them down below this video and I will do my best to help you or to clarify anything that I maybe left out. Hopefully I didn't leave anything out, but if you have any questions, you know where to drop them. If you would like to try a free virtual field trip to take your students on, make sure you check out the link in the description box below this video. I have a free virtual field trip you can use to take your students to the Dominican Republic. So that would be a great way to start off a unit there. All right, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.